As of 2014, I am the uh, director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at Harvard University and the chair of the astronomy department there. And uh, one of the biggest frustrations that I have is to see young people around me, uh, students or postdoctoral fellows, that subscribe to the mainstream of uh, research without questioning it. Uh, there is a tendency of most of the young people that I interact with to accept what they are being told uh, and not to deviate much from uh, the direction that is carved out for them by the entire community. And I think that is not necessarily healthy for science. I think uh, especially young people need to um, venture to uh, explore ideas um, that were not considered by other people. Uh, and at least throughout my career, uh, I continuously try to do that. The reason it's important is that often uh, the truth is not um, advocated by the mainstream. Uh, and there are many examples for um, uh, proposals of ideas that were rejected by most people uh, until eventually they turned out to be right. And the only way to make progress in science is by exploring ideas uh, out of the conventional uh, thinking. Most of them may turn out to be wrong, but every now and then one of them could turn out to be a discovery. So a fundamental question is how to nurture scientific discoveries despite their unpredictable nature. Uh, we cannot tell in advance which idea would lead to a breakthrough. But we can, uh, in principle, develop a culture where um, it's uh, considered uh, appropriate to question authority, to actually explore uh, ideas that may turn out to be wrong, that are somewhat risky. And if we look at the business world, uh, it turns out that, for example, Bell Labs, for many decades, uh, developed a culture like that. They had a group of physicists uh, that they put in the same corridor. These were very creative uh, individuals that were allowed to think about problems that do not have a practical application necessarily, even though they were doing so within an organization whose purpose is to make money. But these people were given freedom of thought. At the same time, they were uh, strongly connected to experimentalists. Uh, so that's another very important ingredient. Just pure thought could lead you in directions that um, have no relevance to reality. And so having interaction or a dialogue with people that collect data or are able to test ideas through experiments is very important. It develops a healthy dialogue between uh, theories that come up with ideas and testing these ideas and finding out which one works and which one is a good description of reality. That's an extremely important element. And so Bell Labs uh, developed that culture and harvested a lot of fruits over the decades that it did so. The laser was invented there, uh, the CCD, uh, the discovery of the cosmic microwave background uh, came out of Bell Labs. Uh, so in many of these cases, the discoveries could not have been predicted. Uh, so you can ask, how did they nurture these discoveries in that environment? And the answer is they allowed a group of talented, creative people to, uh, to venture, to, to take risks, to come up with ideas that will not necessarily succeed. And most of the time, ideas do not work out. As long as that is allowed and that is encouraged, every now and then um, you stumble across a discovery that changes the way people think. Uh, and uh, overall, when you integrate over a long period of time, you find out that, in fact, it's, uh, it's a good business practice. Uh, you can actually uh, benefit and make a profit uh, from such a culture. So even though on a daily basis you often see um, initiatives that do not turn out to, to be uh, productive, Every now and then you get one that makes uh, a breakthrough that pays for all the at failed attempts. And surprisingly, uh, funding agencies uh, in science did not fully realize this, this practice, even though the business world did so. 
And so one aspect of my advocacy is to argue that uh, federal funding agencies in science should allocate a small fraction of their funding, say 10 to 20 percent, to risky projects, r projects that uh, take a risk. Uh, it's not clear whether a discovery will come out of it. Most of the time they will fail, but every now and then we might harvest the fruits of that discovery. In addition, in parallel to that, uh, I would like to encourage young people to take risks. There is clear uh, pressure on young people to get a job, and so that's why they often advocate mainstream ideas that resonate with the leaders of the field that uh, provide these jobs. But at the same time, uh, I think to differentiate yourself from a large group of, of people. There is a very heavy competition nowadays uh, among young people. And in order to make yourself special and different, you do have to invest a small fraction of your time also in risky ideas. Uh, you can't just do what everyone else is doing because you, then you are indistinguishable from everyone else. So um, aside from, from that, I think it's very important to recognize that having a diversity of ideas is very positive. Often people advocate diversity of, um, in terms of ethnic origin or gender. Having more women in science is uh, very important. Uh, and having uh, minorities participate in scientific research is extremely important as well. But uh, there needs to be also encouragement of diversity of ideas so that not everyone is subscribed to the same dogma and people explore multiple ideas at any given time and use experiments and data to rule out those that are not relevant to reality. Uh, because every now and then, the community as a whole is going in the wrong direction. And the only way to correct that would be for people to explore other ideas. So at any given time, there should be always multiple uh, ideas, diversity of ideas. And uh, using experiments to rule out some of the ideas allows us to make progress. Nowadays, um, much of scientific research is done using computers and computer simulations in particular. For example, in cosmology, when we try to describe how structure formed in the universe, starting from the initial conditions of the universe, to become the galaxies and the groups of galaxies, the filaments in the distribution of galaxies that we see nowadays, uh, we use computer simulations. And uh, there is a standard cosmological model by now that describes the initial conditions of the universe and the constituents of the universe that allow us to develop the structure that we have today. And almost exclusively, most of the researchers doing computer simulations are following the standard model of cosmology. They are thinking within the simulation box of the standard model of cosmology and just trying to improve technically the uh, resolution of the simulation or uh, the details, various aspects of the physics of the simulation. Um, however, it may well be uh, that we are missing something very fundamental in the picture that we have of the universe. Because after all, we don't know what the dark matter is. The dark matter accounts for most of the matter in the universe. M more than 80% of the matter in the universe is dark. And we don't know if it's a new type of particle. Maybe it's something else. Perhaps it's modified gravity. Uh, perhaps gravity, the way we describe it, is not uh, accurate. And that's why we think there is dark matter, but actually there is no dark matter. And until we find out the answer to this, we should be somewhat skeptical of the standard cosmological model. The standard cosmological model also have another component, uh, which is actually dominant in the present day universe, and that's the vacuum uh, mass density, the so-called cosmological constant. It accounts for 70% of the mass budget of the universe. So we have the dark matter making 80% of the matter in the universe, and then we have the dark energy or the cosmological constant, the vacuum energy density, making up 70% uh, of the mass budget in the universe. And so basically the only constituent that we know about and we un fully understand is the ordinary matter, which makes up just about 5% of the matter of, of the universe. And the rest is dark. And so 
I'm not saying that the description we have of the dark matter and dark energy is wrong, but I'm saying that we should remain skeptical until we figure out what is the dark matter and what is this dark energy that uh, causes the accelerated expansion of the universe. So at this point in time, even though we know a lot, we're still quite ignorant as to the constituents of the universe. And it's really surprising that we are getting paid to do cosmology these days because we still don't understand what most of the universe is made of. <laughs>